these Sunday evenings, we are engaged in a series of sermons on the subject of God's amazing grace. And we have taken the themes or the topics on each of these Sunday evenings from a hymn that we have been learning from this hymn book we've been using the last year or two, the hymn book Praise, and the hymn, Oh, How the Grace of God Amazes Me, is number 749 in our hymn book. We have been exploring why it is that the grace of God really is amazing. And we've been doing that for several reasons, including these reasons, that those who are not Christians, by and large, do not find the grace of God terribly amazing and need to be amazed by it. And sadly, those of us who are Christians can become so accustomed to the grace of God that we lose sight and sense of its graciousness. It no longer amazes us, and we have lost our grip on the gospel of Jesus Christ, lost our grip on spiritual reality, and we need to rediscover how amazing the grace of God is. And this hymn, originally penned uh, by Mr. E.T. Sibomana in the Burundi tongue, has been translated into English, and in English, as I imagine in Burundi, my Burundi these days is a little weak, as you would understand. In both languages, the hymn has a rather interesting and unusual structure. It begins with a verse on the privileges of the grace of God setting us free from our spiritual bondage. It loosed me from my bonds and set me free. It goes on from the spiritual liberation that we experience when we come to faith in Jesus Christ to the highest of our spiritual privileges, that we are brought, adopted into God's family. Oh, the love that made him run to meet his erring son. The language is from the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. This is, again, the grace of God. And then, in another two verses, we are taken to the heart and to the root of the gospel and to the cause of these spiritual blessings, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ dying for us on the cross. And it's interesting at that point, very striking indeed at that point, that the hymn writer goes on then to give us two verses that focus in on the testing and trials of the Christian life, and especially on the Christian life as a spiritual battle. You'll notice that in verse 5, he speaks of Satan's darts. And then in verse 6, he goes on to speak of Satan's arts. He is thinking about the Christian as somebody who, as soon as he is brought, as soon as she comes to faith in Jesus Christ, finds him or herself walking in a world that is full of hidden minds, explosive, dark, sinister, explosive devices that are planted there by a sinister hand in order to destroy our Christian faith. And when our Christian faith cannot be destroyed, to destroy precisely what this hymn is all about, namely, my enjoyment of the grace of God. And that is a very frequent occurrence in the lives of Christian believers. Satan cannot ultimately destroy our Christian faith but he can do much to destroy our enjoyment of that Christian faith, our enjoyment of the grace of God in the gospel. And one of the ways in which Pastor Sibo Mano recognized this took place was by these fiery darts of the devil that are flung, directed against the Christian. That little expression there is drawn from Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, where he says that the Christian needs the shield of faith. 
And the word he uses there for a shield comes from the Greek word for a door. It's the great oblong, long shield that Roman soldiers wore into battle to protect them. They could use them in all kinds of ways, but it was like going into battle protected by a huge door. And those doors were often dampened in order that the fiery arrows that would be thrust at them from behind enemy lines instead of destroying the Roman army would merely be quenched. It was a tactic. Those of you who have seen the movie Gladiator will remember from the opening scenes there that the Roman army itself often used firing these arrows that had these huge heads on them that would be dipped in pitch and then set ablaze and firing them over enemy lines and destroying the opposition. And Paul picks up this picture. He is not obviously thinking about a Roman soldier who is standing there guarding him in prison, although he was then in prison. He is thinking about the Roman soldier on the battlefield. And he is saying to us in the same way the Christian lives in a battlefield. And the Christian discovers that he or she becomes prone to the attacks of the evil one. But the wonder of the gospel is the glory of God's grace is that he is able to provide for us a marvelous defense against all of Satan's opposition. And it's in that context and against that background that I'm drawing your attention this evening to these famous verses in Romans chapter 8, and I do so for this reason. It is one thing for us to know, as we were seeing this morning, one thing for us to know that God is our shield as His people. It is another thing for us to know in experience how to use the shield that God gives to His people. In New Testament Christian living, knowledge itself is never enough. Knowledge needs to be translated into wisdom. So it is not enough for me to know the answers to the big theological questions that all begin with the word what. What is this? What is that? What is the truth of this? What is the truth of that? All of that is of no use to me unless I can go on to answer the question, what is the value of that truth to my Christian living? How do I do it? How do I put it into practical action? And it's here that the Apostle Paul is constantly a help to us and perhaps very clearly in this particular passage. Because this passage that John Rushton has read for us begins with one of the most stunning statements about the knowledge the Christian has. The Christian knows that all things are worked by God together for the Christian's good. Because that Christian has been called according to God's purpose. The Christian knows that God has an unbreakable, invincible plan. Those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. This, we know, is God's certain plan. But you can know all that, and it make not a whit difference to the way you live your Christian life just as you can know that God is gracious, and yet your own Christian life have no real living contact, it would seem anymore, with the wonders of that grace. The real question for Paul and for me is not, is God able to keep His people secure? But how is God going to keep me secure? Not do I know what God's plan is, but what practical difference does that make to my life? Not what do I know, 
but how do I put into action what I know so that my life is more and more transformed, as he says here in verse 29, into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will notice that when Paul turns from Romans 8, 28 to 30 to Romans 8, 31 to 39, he then begins to probe the answer to that kind of question. What actual practical difference does my knowledge of this truth make to my Christian life? Or to put it this way, Paul is saying the Christian believer is secure. And Paul is now asking the question, but what does that mean to me when I feel as though all hell has been let loose in an assault against my soul? What do I do then? How do I use the truth that God has revealed to me in order to stand in the evil day? How does God, in practical terms, keep the Christian believer secure when the fiery darts of Satan are aimed at him and heading towards her? And it's just there that the questions Paul asks, I think, have got very great significance. If you look at these intensely familiar verses to most of us, verse 31 to the end, he begins by asking a what question. What are we going to say in response to this? What's the cash value of this is what he really means. But then I want you to notice from that point onwards... Verse 31b, if God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Verse 34, who is he that condemns? Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? All of these, if I may be a little technical for a moment, are personal interrogative pronouns. He is not saying, what is going to do this? He is saying, who is going to do this? Or to catch the drift of what he's saying, perhaps a little more accurately, the nuance of what he's saying is, who is going to attempt to do this? If God is for us, who in all the world is going to attempt to do this? Now, The question is, why does Paul change from the interrogative what to the personal interrogative who? Why this insistence on who? And the answer, of course, is because he knows who. What he goes on to describe here is simply another way of Paul describing four of the most powerful fiery arrows that Satan aims at Christian believers, young and old, in order to destroy our enjoyment of the grace of God, and if he could, in order to destroy our living and joyful Christian faith. It is Satan who says, number one, God is not really for you. How can you know that's true when you see the things that are happening in your life? Question number two, there are accusations that I am going to bring against you, and there is nothing you can say to stop them from sticking. Question number three, for all you may already be a Christian, there is a condemnation day coming in your life. Question number four, how do you think? given your track record as a Christian believer, how do you think that there is any hope of you surviving to heaven's glory? And you see all the time, you see what these fiery arrows are seeking to do as they plunge their way into our minds. Many of you here this evening know a little of this as they plunge They are way into our minds. They suddenly catch fire. Our mind becomes a whole world that is aflame. 
And we almost immediately lose sight and sense and sound of the strong word of the gospel that says to us, there is nothing in all creation that is ever going to be able to separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. So, when Satan's darts are aimed against us, what are we to do? What are we to learn here from the teaching of the Apostle Paul as he himself faces down his enemy and looks at these four darts that he himself had obviously experienced on more than one occasion as Satan sought to destroy his faith. Who can be against us? Paul speaks here, first of all, about God's provision for us in Jesus Christ. If God is for us, then of course it follows that there is nothing really in the last analysis can stand against us. That's just logical, isn't it? Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. If there were something that could rise up against God and overcome God, then that other thing would be the true God and God would be a false God. So the Apostle Paul is asking this question, who in the last analysis can be against us if God is for us? But that isn't really the question, is God for me? The real question is, how do I know that God is for me? How do I know that God is for me? And that's a question on which Satan is very insistent. He's been insistent on that question right from the beginning of time. You find it already in Genesis 3. You find it all the way through the Bible. How do you know God is really for you? Where are you going to look for the proof that God is for you? Are you going to look back on your life? Is it one of unsullied happiness? Has the trajectory of your Christian life been one of undifferentiated joy? Where are you going to look to be absolutely certain that God is for you? Paul tells us that the answer to that question is to be found in the provision that God has made for us in Jesus Christ. Verse 32 we can be sure that God is for us because this God, the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up to the cross for us all. In fact, the language, the very, the very language Paul uses there is a verb that's used frequently in the last 24 hours or so of Jesus' life to describe the way that he was handed over systematically by one person and another group to die upon the cross of Calvary as a criminal bearing the judgment of God. And Paul says, here is, here is the heart of the gospel and the wonder of the gospel. That that awful tragedy of the best of all men dying as though he were the worst, it's not simply a matter of human ingenuity to destroy a good man. It is part of the purpose and plan of God behind all the handing over of the Lord Jesus, of Judas Iscariot and Herod and the priests and the Roman soldiers and Pontius Pilate, behind all their handing of him over to be crucified, there was the hand of his heavenly Father handing him over to the cross in order to die in the place, in the room of sinful men and women and boys and girls to bear God's judgment and wrath against their sin in order that God might be able to point us to the cross and say, do you see how much I love you? But I am prepared in my own Son to bear my own judgment against your sin. My friend, you will never understand the heart of God until you understand that that is the heart of God. I may have told some of you before of the impact made on me reading Professor Nicholas Walter Storff's 
book, Lament for a Son, in which he describes his experience when he learned that his son had died in a climbing accident in Europe. Here is one of the truly great intellectuals of North America, professor at Yale University, man with a brilliant intellect. And in the midst of this book, with all that fame, with all that ability, he says, do you know if somebody wants to know who Nick Walterstorff really is, the one thing they need to know about me is I am a man whose son died. That is the defining event of my life. My son died. And if you want to listen to the heartbeat of God that assures you that ultimately nothing can be against you. You dare not look simply at the circumstances of your life and conclude, well, things are going well for me, so I think I might make it. The only place in the universe that you can hear the heartbeat of Almighty God beating for you in infinite love is when you begin to understand the inner meaning of the death of Jesus on the cross that rather than you bear God's judgment against your sin, God Himself bore His own judgment in the person and, may I put it reverently, in the loss of His own Son. You know, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 that he was prepared to count everything as loss for the excellency of of knowing Jesus Christ as his Lord, you can turn that round and say, the Heavenly Father was prepared to count everything as loss. He was prepared to count his own dear Son as lost in order that you and I might know that there is nothing will ever get in the way of his wonderful love and grace towards us. And so as this fiery dart comes towards the Apostle Paul, how do you know God really loves you? It isn't because I deserve to be loved. It isn't because I have some brilliant way of working out what the mysteries of my life really mean. It is because I know that God has given His Son for me. And if He has given His Son for me, as He concludes in verse 32, then I know that He will stop at nothing in order to bring me to His eternal glory. The Apostle John, in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, sees the throne of God, and at the center of that throne of God, there stands a Lamb as though it had been slain. That's the only way that we can look at the throne of God is through the slain Lamb. And so he concludes that there is, in the last analysis, no opposition that can withstand God's purposes and love for us. The second question is in verse 33. Who will bring any charge or accusation against those whom God has chosen? Who can bring any charge or accusation against those whom God has chosen? If the answer to the first question is found in God's gift of His Son, then the answer to the second question is found in God's justification of sinners. Now, it's interesting here, isn't it? Verse 33, he will bring any charge or accusation against those whom God has chosen. The Bible's answer is Satan. He'll do it. Indeed, that's the title that's given to him in Revelation chapter 12. The accuser of the brethren. And he uses all kinds of things, as the Bible makes clear to us, to accuse Christian believers of guilt and sin 
that might damn them in the presence of God. There is a very interesting illustration of that in the third chapter of the Old Testament book of Zechariah, where Joshua the high priest is standing before God as though he were standing before God's judgment seat. And his his clothes are covered in filth. And Satan is standing there accusing him, saying to God, look at him, look at him, covered in the filth of his sin." In different ways, Satan can even use the holy law of God, accusing us of sin. He uses the remaining influence of our sinful hearts, stirring it up, accusing us of sin. He brings sudden temptation into our minds. And the very fact that these thoughts are in our minds enable Him to come and to accuse us. Because those things are in our minds that have no place in the mind of a Christian believer. There is one of the most stunning illustrations of this in all Christian literature in John Bunyan's great book, The Pilgrim's Progress, where Bunyan, and this, this is written straight out of Bunyan's own experience. He describes Christian finding himself in a context of spiritual battle, and he's, he's fighting his end. He's trying to keep going. And then says Bunyan, one thing I would not let slip. I took notice that now poor Christian was so confounded that he did not know his own voice. Now, this may be mumbo-jumbo to some of you, but it's not mumbo-jumbo to all of you. He did not even know his own voice. And thus I perceived it. This is, what, this is what he saw. Just when he was come over against the mouth of the burning pit. And here comes the fiery dart. One of the wicked ones got behind him, stepped up softly to him, and whisperingly suggested many grievous blasphemies to him, which he verily thought had proceeded from his own mind. This put Christian more to it than anything that he met with before, even to think he should now blaspheme him that he loved so much before. Yet could he have helped it, he would not have done it. But he had not the discretion neither to stop his ears nor to know from whence those blasphemies came. Now I say that comes straight out of John Bunyan's experience. There would be people who would say, that man cannot possibly be a Christian if there are blasphemies against the Lord Jesus in my mind. John Bunyan, who was in his own day one of the great preachers of the Christian gospel in England, as most of you in this building know, describes in his autobiography, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, the experience of standing in a pulpit preaching the gospel and his mind flooded with blasphemies. Flooded with blasphemies. Those are the lengths to which Satan will go. And do not, my dear friends, for a moment let the world pull its foolish wool over your eyes and say there is no such being as Satan. Some of you have experienced that. C.H. Spurgeon, the great 19th century Baptist preacher, spoke about exactly this experience. Although he had never heard a single soul in his life blaspheme Christ, Now, where does that come from? It comes from the pit of hell. That's where it comes from. But you see what Bunyan says about poor Christian. He didn't know that. Most Christian believers who experience this have no idea where it comes from. And they experience the very same thing that poor Christian and Pilgrim's Progress experience. I must be damned to hell. Isn't that what you would conclude? I must be damned to hell, blaspheming Jesus Christ, because he was hardly able to discern the difference 
between those impressions that were being made upon his mind and what the permanent desire of his heart really was to live for Jesus Christ and to love Jesus Christ. Now, what are you going to do when that happens in your life? What are you, where are you going to go? To whom can you turn? You cannot turn to what a mature Christian you have been. You cannot turn to the quality of your Christian service. You cannot turn to your spiritual condition and say, ah, I know I'm better than that. No, you need to learn the lesson that Martin Luther, who knew a thing or two about this as well, incidentally, that Martin Luther learned. He said, I need to come to understand that the gospel that saves me is entirely outside of me. The gospel that saves me is entirely outside of me. Your regeneration does not save you, Christian friend. The fact that you have been born again, that doesn't save you. That would give you a new heart, but it would do nothing to bring the forgiveness of your sins. The gospel that saves you is entirely outside of you. God justifying you is not some feeling that you have in your heart. You may have all kinds of feelings as a result of it, but it's not something God does in your heart. It's something God has done for you in Jesus Christ, outside of you. And it's because He's done it outside of you, in His Son, that you can be absolutely sure that since your salvation rests not on what you have done, but on what He has done, then that salvation is going to keep you through hell and high water until you reach the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to know that. If you are going to make advance, I beg you, Christian believer, if you're going to make real advance in the Christian faith, you must understand that it's nothing in you that saves you. It's not your faith. Your faith is a poor and crumbling thing. It's not your new heart. It's not your Christian service. It is exclusively what Jesus Christ has done for you that is able to save you. And if you cling to anything else, you are clinging to flotsam and jetsam that will bring you down under the waves eventually if you ever experience anything like this kind of spiritual attack. You will be a lost man or woman. And we sing that often, don't we? I may my fierce accuser face and tell him, I'm born again. No. Tell him I made a decision 20 years ago. No. Well, what are you going to tell him? None of, he can wipe these things away. Those things are chicken feed to him. But you tell him, Christ has died for me and borne God's judgment against my sin. And even what you put into my mind that I so hate but cannot deliver myself from, even all your mighty actings are not able to reduce one whit the perfection of Jesus Christ's power to save me. And you see, when you grasp that, that's freedom. When you grasp that, as Luther says, it, it, is, like, it is like a door opening into heaven, and you begin to realize why it is and how it is that you can live in the face of these demonic attacks that Christians often experience because you're not thrust back upon your own resources or your spiritual qualities, but you are poured out to rest exclusively on what Jesus Christ has done for you. And what Jesus Christ has done for you is absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. In what Jesus Christ has done for you, there is not one tiny crack that one of these dark satanic arrows is able to pierce through to destroy you. Because Jesus Christ, as we were thinking about Abraham this morning, has become your shield. He is my shield and buckler. 
this hymn teaches us to sing. And you are as righteous. I love to say this to Christian people who are under this kind of pressure. You are as righteous before God as Jesus Christ is righteous. Isn't that something? You are as righteous before God as Jesus Christ is righteous because the only righteousness you have before God, if you have any righteousness, is Jesus Christ's righteousness. We sing that in another great hymn, Zinzendorf's hymn, isn't it? Bold shall I stand on that great day, clothed in His righteousness divine. You contribute nothing to that righteousness. Your faith contributes nothing to that righteousness. The years you've lived a Christian life contribute nothing to that righteousness. The sins that you have sinned diminish that righteousness not a whit. Isn't that a dangerous thing to say? It's the only thing that will save you. And the glorious thing that the Apostle Paul is saying is this. Who can bring any charge against those whom God has justified? And then it comes to the third question. The third question is this. Who can condemn us? What's the difference between accusation and condemnation? Well, condemnation is the result of falling underneath the accusation. You see, if Satan comes to accuse a Christian believer, and the Christian believer says, you're right. I am a sinner. I don't have any standing in God's presence. Unless that Christian goes to a gospel that is outside of him or her in Jesus Christ, then that Christian is going to be drawn in again to experience what Paul in Romans 8 on more than one occasion calls condemnation, which is not so much the judge's judgment against me as the consequences of that judgment in my imprisonment, in my lifelong bondage. And so he is saying... How am I going to deal with this? You see, dear friends, it is, it is possible, it is possible to listen to Satan, as a Christian believer, to listen to Satan and to believe him rather than believe God. To believe the accusations and not to go to the righteousness of Christ. And then the next step is that from being accused, you begin to experience condemnation, the condemnation of Satan, the condemnation of yourself. Well, what is going to bring you back from that? What is going to secure you in Jesus Christ? Well, look at Paul's answer to that question. Who is he that condemns? Well, Satan certainly seeks to condemn. But Christ Jesus has died more than that He was raised to life. He is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Think of Simon Peter. He had sinned. He had denied his Lord. Don't you think there were fiery darts flying through the dark Jerusalem night after that? As the poor man on his own, isolated from Jesus, isolated from the disciples, was looking for some dark spot where he might cry his way into despair. Think of the thoughts that must have been filling his mind when he thought, I didn't have the courage to stand up for my Lord, and my Lord's going to be crucified, and there's nothing I can do about it. There's no way back for me. That is an awful thing to hear a Christian believer say, but Christian believers do say it. There is no way back for me. Where are you going to look when there's no way back for you? Well, here is his answer. Christ Jesus, who died, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he is interceding, praying for me. 
just what Peter remembered, incidentally. He remembered the word of the Lord, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, to sift you like wheat. Isn't that what we're talking about? Isn't it Jesus who teaches us that this is what Satan does in the lives of Christians? Sifts them like wheat. Here is a young person who has come to a living faith in Christ, and then Satan has come and sifted them like wheat to blow them away. Where can you look? Peter remembered the word of the Lord, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith in me will not fail. He's not finished his work when he dies on the cross or rises from the grave or ascends to the right hand of the Father. He is there on our behalf. You know how the papers sometimes say and the media sometimes say, sources close to the king or sources close to the president. Here is a source close to the king. And he is praying for you. Isn't that moving to think? Isn't it liberating to think that when I've made such a mess of my life, and not only do I feel the accusation of Satan, but I feel my own self-condemnation, and I am ashamed to go into the presence of God. I come to church and I look around me and I think these people are singing these hymns and their lives are so different from mine, but I am a hypocrite. I am a failure. I am a disaster. I seem to have lost everything that I once experienced. And then I remember that He is at the right hand of the Father and He is saying to His Father, Father, that dear one there, look at them in their weakness, in their frailty, in their sin, in their self-condemnation, and all the fire that's going on in their minds. And the Father hears the prayers of His Son and answers them. We have another hymn that we sing about that, don't we? Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is written on his hands. My name is hidden in his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no power can force me to depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, I look to heaven and see him there who made an end of all my sin because the sinless Savior died. My sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. When you get so low as this, never, ever, ever, ever forget this that Almighty God can never see you as a child of God without, first of all, looking at you through His Son who is praying for you. And so he comes to his final question in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Yes, there is opposition, but... will not prevail. Yes, there is accusation, but it will not stick. Yes, there may be condemnation, but it cannot destroy. But can there possibly be then separation? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And you'll notice in Paul's response to this question that he takes a very different line of attack in response to this question. In the, in the responses to the other questions, He's really saying to us, now, Christian believer, stop and think this through. Think this through. Think this through. But here, he has no argument. He's done with arguments. He doesn't need any more arguments. He just asks questions. And he ransacks a universe of catastrophe and pressure and trouble and opposition. 
and, and he, he just asks the question, can this or this or this or this or this ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? And the answer, of course, brings us back to the beginning of the passage in the purposes that this God has for us in Christ, in the absolute certainty of their fulfillment. Those He predestined, He called. Those He called, He justified. Those He justified, He glorified. He will not be stopped in bringing us, as He says in verse 29, ultimately, to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And when at the last we stand before Him and say to Him, Father, what was the meaning? What was the meaning of all that darkness? What was the meaning of all that pressure? What was the meaning of all those experiences that almost destroyed me? His answer simply is, but those were the instruments he was using to polish you and polish you and polish you for heaven's glory and everything you need to get you from here to there is found in Jesus Christ. He speaks about four kinds of attack. Who is against us? Who will accuse us? Who can condemn us? Who can separate us? And if you move from behind this shield of faith, this door-like shield of faith, and have a look at what is emblazoned on the front of that shield, you will find in the middle a cross. And in each of the quadrants a symbol. In the first, the cross of Christ that proves that God is for us. In the second, the justification of the ungodly that proves that no accusation will stick. In the third, the interceding Lord Jesus Christ to assure us we can never be condemned. And in the fourth, the indestructible love of God that persuades us that nothing will ever be able to separate us from Jesus Christ, our Lord.